And good evening, good afternoon, whenever and wherever this may find you. Glad you guys could join us for our study in eschatology. We're in part number 25, and after tonight, we'll be exactly halfway, halfway. through. We're in the book of Revelation, going through chapter by chapter. We are going to be in chapter number 8 tonight, and look at the, the seventh seal, the seventh trumpet, as we go through this. Uh, and as always, we'll begin with uh, the first topic is silence in heaven. Silence in heaven, mm -hmm. and if you don't mind getting those verses You bet. Me. Revelation 8, 1, when the Lamb opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And we have to stop for a half hour, not do anything. Right. Right. <laughs> right. It may, may be symbolic of something. There are three reasons for this silence in heaven, mm -hmm. uh, and I'll show them on the screen here. Number one, uh, the silence in heaven uh, for the space of a half an hour is a deep, is a sign of deep respect and awe in the presence of the judge of all the earth. Mm -hmm. The second one. The half hour silence in heaven is the result of somber reflection on what has just been revealed. And number three, the silence in heaven is due to the severity of the actions of the Lord God is about to take. Mm. So it's kind of a pause in action. It's a pause to think about what's just been revealed. It's a reflection on that. And then it's a, it's a pause to kind of catch our breath before what we see to happen with the uh, rest of the trumpets and mm. all this sort of a thing. You're familiar with the phrase, Jerry, vengeance is mine? I am. And who in the Bible says, vengeance is mine, I will repay? Uh, the Lord. Right. <laughs> uh, God, in the, in the end, God balances the books. Right. Amen. And, and God will get justice. And, and you know, we, we live and we see a lot of injustice in the world because the world's imperfect. And we see people who are uh, just claiming to be Christians, who are right. wolves in sheep's clothing, who preach a prosperity gospel right. and live in opulent mansions, very, very wealthy and uh, fly private jets and this and you think man it they'll get what's coming to them and i think that they will they will unless they repent yeah that's exactly right and we do pray for the repentance and we we do know of people who have or we know of people who have committed crimes and gotten away with it mm -hmm. but really you don't in the end of things in the cosmic scheme of god's justice you don't get away with any anything Amen. but from the perspective of the bible vengeance is god's and right. he, he ultimately has the right to uh to dole out punishment. Right. And we're going to see that tonight uh, as we read Revelation chapter 8. But before we get there, Luke chapter 18, verses 7 through 8, Jesus says, All right, and will not God give justice to his elect who cry to him day and night? Will he delay long over them? I tell you, he will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth or right. on earth? And I think that this phrase, Son of Man, comes. When he returns, I think when Jesus uses that phrase, it's not in reference to a second coming, the second advent. It's often in, in, uh, in reaction to his rejection and his coming in destruction and judgment upon that generation. Now, right. Paul will take that phrase, coming of the Son of Man, the clouds of heaven, and he's going to refer to Christ's glorious second coming as advent. Right. But that's a different time. Before Christ's crucifixion, his earthly ministry, that phrase is often used to describe the destruction of Jerusalem on the apostate nation. Paul will use that differently. I see often Paul redeemed words and used them differently. Right, right. Lot, there's different comings of Christ in yeah. the Bible. There mm -hmm. really is. We're celebrating the season of his first coming. Mm -hmm. uh, there is the future second coming, the end of all things. And then there are the comings of Christ in judgment or the comings of God in judgment in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Revelation 8, 2 through 5. Then I saw the seven angels who stand before God and seven trumpets were given to them. And another angel came and stood at the altar with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angels. Then the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and threw it on the earth, and there were peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. All right. Now... In some forms, of some expressions of Christianity have a much higher church form of religion. They will have mm -hmm. incense and candles burn in every service. And those right. candles often burning uh, in symbolic uh, reference to prayers going upward, worship going upward. It's a smoke ascends upward, you know, to heaven. It's it's like they're riding on, like it's like your prayers mm -hmm. are going up. Now, that's all symbol, symbol isn't it? We, we don't have that. Now, in our church during the Advent season, we do light candles during those services, but normally we don't keep candles lit. But but fire is a part of worship in the Old Covenant, and here you see this 
idea of the fire being used, the, the censer being used. We saw it in the Old mm -hmm. Covenant. We see it here in this revelation here. Uh, as the prayers of the saints are rising up like on the, on the uh, smoke of the incense burning, right? Right. Um, this ought to remind us of Revelation chapter 6, verses 10 through 11. And they cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how, oh, how long before you... How long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and brothers should be complete, who were to be killed as they themselves had been. And we looked at this mm. a couple of weeks ago. We're looking at chapter 6. And this is that these verses like this are what made Martin Luther not want to put this book in the Bible because he said the saints are dead and they're asking for vengeance or asking for God to repay. <laughs> well, yeah, they are. Uh, and And... I don't think it's anything wrong with praying these imprecatory psalms, but I think we ought to temper that with God, forgive my hard heartedness, forgive my, right. you know, it's okay. We pray that in honesty to God. God, you have justice on those that have wronged me. I think at the end of the day, we've got to pray for those who've wronged us. Amen. Uh, and <laughs> it doesn't just mean pray the imprecatory psalms right. over them. No, we're tempted <laughs> to do that. God, break, break their knees, you know. Right. Uh, but, but in the end, I think as we pray those kind of prayers, God works in us for us to forgive them because we sound so foolish. You pray that long enough, God, just those who've wronged me, get, get them back. And you pray that long enough, mm -hmm. you realize, boy, if I put myself in, you know, in God's perspective here, how often have I wronged God? Right. You know, I, I, exactly. I'd be more like this. Well, Jared, you're overreacting. They've done far worse to me than they have you. Get a grip. Get over yourself. Mm -hmm. Uh, if I give justice to them, it's because it's in my time and my right, standard. Right. Yeah, any time that we're uh, frustrated or angry with someone because of what they've done to us, like you said, we've got to always remember that what we have done against God is worse than what anybody could ever do to us. That's right. And that's true for every person that sins, and everybody sins against God. Those sins are, get, are, are what R.C. Spro called cosmic treason. It's rebellion toward the Creator, Amen. every sin that we do. But you notice that verse, we went back to verse 6, uh, chapter 6, verse 11 says, they were told to rest a little longer. Right. These phrases, coming soon, little longer, are perspectival phrases, right? That means to the people that are written, and uh, while, while long and soon and at hand uh, are matters of perspective, right? How long? Mm -hmm. It depends mm -hmm. how long. If you're holding a, uh, a one-pound weight, not very heavy you can pick that up but if you hold it for half an hour it gets heavy it's really heavy and so a matter of perspective is uh, how long is a little while when you're holding you know five or ten pound weight what well, de <laughs> right. depends well this idea here is this this is a context of the first century martyrs and those who've already died have gone to heaven and they're they're saying to god you know have exercise vengeance on right, those right. and guys a little bit longer a little bit longer and that's a reference to that short period of time from the revelation until uh, the destruction of Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. He's like, just, just be patient. It's about to happen here. Well, the prayers of the martyred saints in heaven is for the justice of God. Right. They want God to avenge their executioners. It is a call back to the prayers we saw in chapter 6. Exactly. So what is the prayer of the saints in heaven during this that time? I say during that time because it's past tense. Right. And obviously, uh, praying that God would judge those who uh, executed them. And again, you can rejoice with God's in God's justice. You can't necessarily and probably shouldn't rejoice in the the eternal damnation of someone, but you can certainly rejoice in the display of God's justice because it's justice. Yep. Unless it's against me, then it's not. Yeah, you it's know. in it's you're I mean, suffering unduly, yeah, right? Yeah, you yeah, shouldn't, yeah, God I, shouldn't treat you that way. That's right. <laughs> it's yeah. unfair, you know. Oh, woe was me. Oh, woe was me. Let's uh, look at some of these plagues here, and I say this is the plagues of Egypt remix. Right. It's, we're going to see what we saw right way back there in, in the Exodus story. Uh, we're going to see some of those plagues resurface here in the Revelation. The plagues that follow the trumpet blast would, would be a replay of the plagues on Egypt during the time of the Exodus. Moses gave a warning to those about to enter the Promised Land that the plagues of Egypt would come upon this nation if they turned away from God. And this is Deuteronomy 28. This is about to happen in, in 70 A.D. And so if you don't mind reading Moses' yeah, sure. warning there in Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 28, 58 and si uh, through 60. If you are not careful to do all the words of this law that are written in this book, that you may fear this glorious and awesome name, the Lord your God, then the Lord will bring on you and your offspring extraordinary afflictions. 
affliction severe and lasting, and sickness grievous and lasting. And he will bring upon you again all the diseases of Egypt of which you were afraid, and they shall cling to you. So we have a warning in the Old Testament about 1,500 years before the birth of Christ. When it's the end of the Promised Land, Moses says, Stop, stop, stop. Before you guys go in, I want you to know, God has said, or God's speaking here, if you are unfaithful to me, if you, uh, you, know, if you turn away from me and, and build idols and those kinds of things, uh, God is going to give you the same kind of plagues, the same kind of destruction that you witnessed the people, the, in, the Egyptians have right. that brought you out of there. Right. Fast forward about 1,500 years and we're going to see Revelation says to that generation who's turned away from Christ, this is now coming upon you. Right, this is the ultimate. I mean, from the time they left Egypt until uh, their rejection of Christ, Israel had always forsaken. They had always gone astray in their hearts. Mm -hmm. They were stiff-necked people, always rebelling against God. But all of those rebellions uh, were kind of a precursor to the ultimate rebellion, the final rebellion, which is what you've said, the rejection of their own Messiah. And to me, it seems like it was about every other generation was faithful to God. Right. There'd be a a generation that was faithful, and then they would in time fall away from God, build idols, turn to the gods of the Philistines or whatever, and they would be judged. And then a revival would happen. They'd come back to Christ. Maybe maybe God would send a prophet or something or call them back to repentance. They would come back. That'd last a little while, and and they'd fall back into sin and that sort of thing. It's not unlike the Christian experience we go through periods of, right. of faithfulness and disobedience. Right. But you're, you're exactly right. This prophecy in Deuteronomy 28 was fulfilled in 70 AD. Though they'd experienced this many times, the ultimate fulfillment was when, right, right. when their nation yeah. was, was changed. Right. We, we've got to, as Christians, realize you know, that the rejection of Christ is a big deal. You know, and in, in Matthew, he talked about the destruction of Jerusalem. You know, this, is, this is God's judgment meted out on ethnic Israel, uh, that rejected him, not elect Israel, not all who are Israel are Israel, but here obviously this is this is a huge deal to reject the Messiah who had been prophesied in eternity past, who was in Genesis 3.15 spoken of, and then finally has come and has been rejected, then they're going to receive the plagues of Egypt. You said not upon the elect, and that's true. It wasn't on them, but they may have gotten as peripheral collateral damage. Right, right, right. And been caught yeah. up in some right. of this stuff. Yeah, there's no eternal destruction of his of his children. Uh, these, and this is a quote from Josephus, I believe. These Roman troops, as if orchestrated by God, and this is an incredible quote. Mm-hmm. These Roman troops, as if orchestrated by God, arrived in Jerusalem in the Jewish month of Tishri, a month that begins the Feast of the Trumpets, mm. called the Day of Judgment. Wow. Mm. It is on this day that trumpets sound the somber days of atonement and final judgment. Thus began the Jewish war. Wow. The war on Jerusalem was the wrath of God being poured out on an apostate nation. Jesus predicted this during his earthly ministry, Luke, uh, various places there in Luke. The sounding of the trumpets during Tishri or September literally correspond with the sacking of the of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Isn't that amazing how wow. God in his... Wow. I mean, I say foresight. I mean, God knew this already. Right. But certainly before it happened, God knew that he would coordinate the fall of Jerusalem with this particular month. Right. Revelation 8 describes the judgments resulting from these trumpet blasts as a series of battles and disasters the Jewish people faced at the hands of the Romans prior to the siege of Jerusalem. Mm. Well, how can the trumpets be understood in the light of the Jewish wars? Well, I mean, it sounds like... Uh, Trumpets of, of judgment. That's what I see. Yeah, and these trumpets that are blasting in Revelation chapter 7 and 8 are referencing the judgment of God upon these people. Right. And it just happened to coordinate with the, the holiday <laughs> right. uh, perfectly. Right. So now let's look, look at the seven trumpets. The seven trumpets. All right. So we're going to look at these seven trumpets and then we're going to see the, the plague that accompanies each trumpet here. So with the first Trumpet, the consequence is a devastation of the earth or the land. Mm -hmm. Number two, uh, targeted toward the seas. And number three, it affects the water supply, which brings death to many Mm, people. That's always a problem. And number four, affecting the sun, moon, and stars. Number five, uh, releases Satan with power to use demonic influence, described as locust, 
to torment those who have rejected God. Mm. Number six, brings an astonishing amount of death. And number seven, finally, it culminates in the reign of Christ. So we see some parallels with, uh, with some of the plagues there. Right. Matthew 27, 24, and 25. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. And I'm not just throwing these quotes from the Gospels in here. They're there for a purpose because these judgments are taking place in Revelation, our judgments on an apostate nation, and we see them asking for this. Jesus said, mm -hmm. warns them it's going to happen. You've turned away from me. And then we see at his very trial in Matthew 27 uh, that they cry out for this. Let his blood be on us and our children. Right. Now, we want to be covered by his blood, <laughs> but we're not responsible um, directly for his his death right now while he died for us. Right. We didn't cry crucify that particular day. Right. But they're saying, yeah, let let us take the full way to the brunt of crucifying this innocent man. And Pilate, this, this act of public sort of uh, um, divorcing himself from this, is not like, I, I, I did nothing to do with this. I'm a politician. You've cornered me. I've got nothing else to do. Uh, I'm going to do what, you, what the people bid. The difference between a politician and a statesman is a politician does what people want, whether it's right or wrong. <laughs> and a statesman does what is right, regardless of what the people want. Mm. Big difference. We don't have many statesmen yeah. serving these days. I don't days. know if I've ever met a statesman. <laughs> right. Uh, but there are plenty of politicians that elected. Not a lot of politicians. I should say no of, anyway. Mm -hmm. Revelation chapter 8, verse 7. The first angel blew his trumpet, and there followed hail and fire mixed with blood. And these were thrown upon the earth. And a third of the earth was burned up, and a third of the trees were burned up, and all green grass was burned up. So we see a devastation on the land when that trumpet blows. The blood of Christ would be upon the generation that crucified him. Right. The hail, fire, and blood mentioned in this verse were possibly all the result of Roman siege of Jerusalem. Mm. A battering ram was defended uh, by siege towers from which soldiers shot arrows and hurled stones at the people defending the city walls. How would the blood of Christ be poured out in the earth? No, you, you mentioned, you know, the blood of Christ was spilt on the cross. It was an atoning sacrifice to redeem a people unto God. But here, you know, in context of what the Jews who rejected Christ and called for his crucifixion said, his blood be on us. And so it's not atoning blood. Mm -hmm. it, it's his murder, basically. Yeah. It's, a, it's a blood of justice. Right. It's a blood of God's wrath being poured out right. upon those people. Right. So the hailstones mentioned in, in Ezekiel 13, 13 appear to be these stones launched at the people of Jerusalem during the siege. The Roman catapults hurled stones, we'll look at this in the future, mm. that weighed about 100 pounds, uh, uh, weighed a talent or 100 pounds each into the city. Cutting weapons like axes and swords are called the fires of blood. Mm. So they had these big mechanical devices that could hurl stones. We think of these uh, medieval contraptions, catapults that throw yeah, stones. Right. They've had that as old as the ancient ancient world with the Romans mm -hmm. doing this sort of thing. This idea of it raining down uh, hailstones that weigh 100 pounds, uh, that literally happened in the siege of Jerusalem. When God says it's going to happen, uh, a lot of this is figurative, but some of these details I think are pretty spot on, literally, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In, in the context. Yeah, I mean, God, in the, in the, in the Bible, He often... Uh, you know, does move heaven and earth to accomplish his purpose. He'll, you know, it really will be some sort of cataclysm that he that he uses. But oftentimes, God uh, uses means to accomplish his end, and that's certainly true with with uh, the preaching of the word, people hearing the gospel. But it's also true with uh, you know armies. He always and forever seems to be using rogue nations to accomplish his purpose. Absolutely. I got a good quote here from Josephus. You're oh, going to tackle yeah. it. Josephus wrote, "At the time, uh, at the same time, such engines as were intended for that purpose threw at once lances upon them with great noise, and stones of a weight of a talent were thrown by the engines that were prepared for that purpose, together with fire and a vast multitude of arrows, which made the wall so dangerous that the Jews durst not come upon it, but durst not come to those parts within the walls which were reached by the engines." Wow. Can you imagine? I mean, the the, the momentum a hundred pound stone has being thrown in your direction. Right. You know, cannonballs when launched from cannon uh, weigh far less than a hundred pounds. Right. I would assume 
on the battlefield could just mow down, would mow down right, troops. You think right. of those Civil War. Right. 100 pound stone crashing into the walls, going over. It was just you know enormous thing. Yep. Well, how does John use the apocaly apocalyptic Im imagery to describe the destruction of right. Jerusalem? Okay, you know, he's using the, uh, the symbolic language of judgment as you know, a natural kind of cataclysm uh, uh, to draw attention to the fact of what we see happening with Rome against Jerusalem. His metaphors are describing actual things. Probably not uh, Apache helicopters because it's probably a little closer to, to the prophecy than, than a lot of people think with the destruction of Jerusalem. Ah, Revelation 8, 8 and 9, the second trumpet is the first plague of the Exodus. The second angel blew his trumpet, and something like a great mountain, burning with fire, was thrown into the sea, and a third of the sea became blood, a third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. Okay. And the first plague on Egypt would have been the... Turning the, blood. the water, the Nile to blood, right? That's, that's right. Matthew 21, 20 through 22. When the disciples saw it, they marveled, saying, How does the fig tree wither at once? Verse 21, Jesus answered them in Matthew 21, Truly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what has been done to the fig tree, but even if you say to this mountain, mm. be taken up and thrown into the sea, it will happen. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. So maybe these are some of those martyred saints, the apostles that died before the destruction of Jerusalem, cr cr crying for the destruction, uh, er, vengeance upon those that killed them. Mm. And God's going to throw a, a mountain <laughs> into the sea, uh, so to speak. And this becomes a literally true when we see uh, these martyred saints praying for the wrath of God. Mm. And stones thrown into the sea kind of a thing. Fascinating. Yeah. Certainly dovetails nicely, doesn't it? does, it? very nicely. It's a good quote from one of my favorites, Doug Wilson. Doug Wilson contends that kingdoms are frequently called mountains in the Scripture. In this case, the mountain is Jerusalem. Jesus alluded to the mountain being cast into the sea when he cursed the fig tree in the judgment of the apostate of apostate Israel. Now, if we keep this uh, this imagery here consistent, right. if Jerusalem is the mountain, and the sea could be, I don't, they didn't pick up the Jerusalem and literally put it into the sea, <laughs> right. uh, but being scattered, like the sea often represents the nations. Right. So Jerusalem being scattered to the nations, the people of Jerusalem being scattered abroad, uh, is probably what's referencing. Yeah, that. I mean, the sea in the Bible, um, when it's used metaphorically, often represents, you know, an approaching nation, a conqueror, mm -hmm. uh, a plunderer or something. I mean, they came across the sea, you know, so you look to the sea and you'd see the enemy coming. In Revelation, it talks there'll be no more sea. Maybe it's a reference to, you know, no more attacking armies. So. That's right. And this is a point secondary to this discussion, so to speak. The Philistines, which were a thorn in the side of the Israelites for many, many years, they weren't originally from Palestine. Mm -mm. They were seafaring people who traveled yeah. from Asia Minor, Greece, somewhere, maybe yeah. further west than that. Kaftor, right? Or so I think that was what they were, where they were from, or what they were called, which would would have been uh, around Greece, that area, like you said, Asia Minor. And they arrived by boat. They can't right. understand when they first entered the Promised Land right. before the conquest. But anyway, that, so the idea of the sea is very common in that context to refer to enemy nations. Yeah, yeah. Philistines were people of the sea. They were. Oh, what that word means. Yeah. Philistine. This trumpet can be understood as the Roman conquest into Galilee as the start of the Jewish wars. These, uh, those escaping to the Mediterranean Sea were, for the most part, killed by the rough waves and dashed upon the rocks. Josephus wrote, quote, Inasmuch that the sea was a, was a bloody long way, some of the Jew, Jewish rebels attempted to flee by crossing the Sea of Galilee. Concerning this, Josephus wrote, One might see the lake all bloody and full of dead bodies, for not one of them escaped. And a terrible stink and a very sad sight there was on the following days over the country. For as for the shores, they were full of bodies, full of shipwrecks, and full of dead bodies all swell. Mm -mm -mm. So when the Romans came in, they wanted to kill them thoroughly. <laughs> and you couldn't escape by land, sea, or air. And any, any escape route that wasn't already cut off, you were just killed along the way. And that's mm -hmm. a quote from Josephus. Is not a preterist. He, he's a Jewish person by ethnic descent. He's a Jewish person by faith, but he has no 
no reason to make this stuff up. When he's writing this, he's writing this as a historian in the first century, just recording what he saw. Right. The Jews fleeing to the south way of the Jordan River fared no better. It was there that 15,000 Jews were killed. Josephus wrote, quote, The Jordan could not be passed over by reason of the dead bodies that were in it, but because uh, the lake of Asphaltitis, the Dead Sea, was also full of dead bodies that were carried down into it by the river. Oh, wow. Uh, asphaltitis. It sounds asphaltitis. Like something. There you go. <laughs> sounds, sounds like a condition a person yeah, might some, have. something you get when you bite the road. <laughs> <laughs> So um, even the Dead Sea, you know, was just right. full of... I mean, you've seen pictures of, of, of war scenes, you know, in Facebook or whatever, put graphic image, you know, hit, tap here to uncover it. Now, the battlefields of war, World War I, just, they were just fields, green fields at one time, and it became war of attrition, and trenches were dug, and those fields became just mud and holes and debris and dead bodies everywhere. And you know, it's what you're seeing here. We don't think of the smell of war. Oh, but the smell of war has been horrendous. If you, if, oh, you, if there's an animal carcass in, in on the side of the road near your home, you smell one one animal carcass. Imagine Ooh, fifteen thousand oh. carcasses of people mm -mm. scattered around. I mean, right. it has a it's got to be rancid right. in a few days. Right. I just don't think we realize how bad seventy AD was for the Jews. It was just un unspeakable. Why was a mountain cast into the sea? Again, judgment, I believe. And Jesus said, look, if you have faith, like a mustard seed, you can say this mountain be thrown into the sea. And, and if you use that imagery in, in this destruction here, as Revelation 8 said a moment ago, the mountain was cast into the sea, it turned to blood. If that's imagery of this sort of thing, the faith of the saints in heaven isn't praying for mountains to be put in the sea. Right. It's praying for the scattering of the nation right. uh, to avenge their... Their right. deaths. And again, we're looking at apocalyptic literature, so you have to keep that in mind as you interpret it. You know, there's a lot of Im symbols and imagery, metaphors, whatever, and certainly this is falls into that category. Yep. You know, I don't have a secret decoder ring that says, ah, oh, what the <laughs> symbol means that. All I'm doing is taking the plain meaning of Scripture in other places, the Gospels namely, and I'm, I'm as a transparent overlay, putting this over Revelation and seeing where everything kind of makes sense there. Revelation 8, 10, and 11. The third angel blew his trumpet, and a great star fell from heaven, blazing like a torch, and it fell on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters became Wormwood, and many people died from the water because it had been made bitter. Some speculate that Wormwood was a comet that appeared in the night sky at the time of the destruction of hmm. Jerusalem. Josephus mentions the comet. Hmm. Others suggest that the star was an angel. There's some references there. Jeremiah 9, 15. Therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will feed this people with bitter food and give them poisonous water to drink. Hmm. You know, in ancient warfare, one of the things you do to your enemy after you conquered him is you would poison his water hole. Right. You have cover it back up, fill it back in, or you would just find ways to poison yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. You can launch dead disease carcasses into the city. or I mean, what is the one thing that, you know, happens in devastation? What is it uh, that uh, that people get from drinking the water after, like, a tsunami? Dysentery and Dys all Yeah, all those things, you know. It's bad. Revelation 8, 10 through 11, then parallels the prophecy found in Jeremiah 9, 15. In Jeremiah's prophecy, like the prophecy from Revelation, Jer Jerusalem is forced to drink from the water made bitter by wormwood after she is convic convicted with adultery. Mm. In the prophet Jeremiah, if you read his, his prophetic writings, he has an indictment against the nation for their harlotry. Mm -hmm. They would broke the marriage covenant vows with God. They broke mm -hmm. that covenant, which is, you know, like a marriage covenant, and were adulterous and chased after foreign idols and foreign gods. And as a result, God was going to send judgment. What we're seeing here in Revelation is that scroll being unrolled. You know, that's mm -hmm. the divorce decree, so to speak, mm. being sent to a nation. Mm. How's it interpreted? Well, there's a couple of ways you can interpret this by way of a, an omen or a star or a comet or something in the sky. Right. There's different ways this, we said it's interpreted. What do we say? An angel mm -hmm. or a comet. We'll push on. Now, people really paid attention to the sky back then. Absolutely. I mean, they did. We and have so much uh, 
what is that called? Light pollution. Light Earth. pollution. Yeah, that we don't get a good look at the sky, yeah. and we don't need we, because we we have clocks, wrist watches. If you're familiar with the night sky, you can tell by the placement of the moon or where the stars are about what time it is in the night. People would say like the third watch or the ninth watch. These references to nighttime right. with no clocks. They were just looking at the positions of stars in the sky. You know, the moon will come up on the horizon and then will set at a certain right. pace. Um, or, or you can know the season of the year in the northern hemisphere by where things are, right. where constellations are. We're totally oblivious to that stuff. Oh, yeah. yeah. If we're outside at night, it's because we happen to be going back to our car or going back into the house or something. We're just walking. We don't look, stop and look up enough. Right. But any anomaly or anything that looked odd in the sky, a, a comet or something that wasn't supposed to be there, was often an omen. It was right. often foretold something disastrous happening to him. Right, right. All right, so we'll move on. Push on, all right. Um, Revelation 8, 12, the fourth trumpet is the ninth plague of the Exodus. The fourth angel blew his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, and a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of their light might be darkened, and a third of the day might be kept from shining, and likewise a third of the night. Now we keep seeing a third of the moon, a third of the mountain, a third of the oceans, a third of the people. That's just more typology. It's mm -hmm. just more symbolism there. It, it means just short of total devastation, right? Mm -hmm. It means it means it's short of total annihilation right. here. Right. Uh, not every Jewish person died in the conquest in 70 AD. Not right. every person in Jerusalem died. Many were taken off and scattered among the nations. Right. But it is a judgment and if, if your nation left lost a third of its population, literally, it'd be devastated. Yeah. It would take a genera several generations to get back a third of your population. Right. It doesn't happen overnight. Yep. So it's this third, fourth trumpet is like the ninth plague of the Exodus, where the, you know, the sun yeah. gets dark and that, big, that uh, eclipse happens over the face of the earth. Mm. Well, Josephus records that during a thunderstorm, the sun, moon, and stars were darkened from Jerusalem. During this time, the Idumeans broke into Jerusalem and killed the high priest, hmm. Ananias the third, the second. Excuse me, I'm adding this another <laughs> generation there. So, in what ways were the sun, moon, and stars dark in the first century? Well, I mean, here Josephus recorded a thunderstorm, and you know how dark it can get with the big old heavy thunderstorm. And you can see the moon sometimes in the daylight when the sun is shining. So. But it was probably a prolonged thunderstorm that covered day and night. It was bad enough that it was it seemed like an omen to the people. Right. It was an unnatural kind of a thing. Right. Revelation eight thirteen. Then I looked and I heard an eagle crying with a loud voice as it flew directly overhead. Woe, woe, woe to the to those who dwell on the earth at the blast of the other trumpets that the three angels are about to blow. Hmm. And this is a reference, I mean, Deuteronomy 28, 9, uh, God says to Moses, it's that warning text, you know, if you go into the nation, you commit right. adultery, this is going to happen to you. 28, 49 says this, the Lord will bring a nation against you from a far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like an eagle, a mm -hmm. nation whose language you do not understand. Right. Now, he's looking ahead, I think, 1,500 years, right? This is Moses' time of Moses, to when the rebellion of the Jews would be completely full, they'd apostatize at that point, they turned away as far as they can, and he's predicting a nation, a Gentile nation from far away, swoops like an eagle. Mm -hmm. I mean, the end of the earth, uh, Spain was as about as far as, as you knew, I and mean, that's where Paul was wanting to go to take the gospel to, and that would have been the ends of the earth for, for people living where uh, Jerusalem was located. And that was still the far edge of the Roman Empire. I mean, right. Rome, Rome still right. had that land. Right. They wouldn't get Great Britain, I think, until a little time after the first right. century, maybe. Well, the eagle in this passage calls to mind the threat of invading nations. God used the image of, an e of the eagle as bringing judgment upon apostate Israel. The symbol for the eagle is the army of Rome that used the eagle on their standard. Hmm. The Roman standard was a pennant, a flag, or a banner suspended or attached to a staff or pole, which identified a Roman legion, like infantry or cavalry. The most famous of these is the eagle. Mm -hmm. And you see that SPQR on their stand. It means right. Senate Populus uh, Romanus, the Roman Senate and the people. They came in representing all those things when right, they conquered. Right. It's not a coincidence, I don't think, that when God said they would come like an eagle, that they're literally carrying the banner of an eagle when they <laughs> right. came and sacked their town. Right. 
Uh, now, it, it does refer to the way in which they swooped into the town, and, and the, you know, an eagle is a, a bird of prey, and it swoops in, and it, pick, it can pick up rabbits and mice and moles and fish and big, big, you know, and eat them. And it's like that's how quick the Romans descended upon right. upon Jerusalem. But it's no coincidence. I don't think that this right. this banner was there. Right. Hosea eight one through three. Set the trumpet to your lips. One like a vulture is over the house of the Lord, because they have transgressed my covenant and rebelled against my law. They cry to me, My God, we Israel know you. Israel has spurned the good. The enemy shall pursue. Now, I believe that this word vulture here, I have to look at this. Of course, it's in Hebrew. I think it's generically bird of prey. Right. And it can often also be translated as much as eagle as it could vulture. Right. It's just, it's just kind of a, the preference of the translator. Right. So that's a Hosea reference to this bird of prey swooping in Jerusalem who has transgressed. Now, Hosea is all about, you know, you've committed injustice. And, you know, Hosea is told to marry this lady named Gomer, who's unfaithful to him. Remember the story of Hosea? Oh, yes, yes. And, and, and God says, you're going to marry this lady who's, gonna, who's unfaithful. She's a prostitute, right? And she bears three kids that aren't Hosea's. <laughs> and he has to and they name these kids, right? You know, uh, not my son and no wayward. Mer no mercy. No, all those right. things. <laughs> Horrible names, right? And then, then she's... Is, is, convicted or whatever for adultery, right, or whatever in the town. And I think she's in prison or something. He has to go redeem her. Right. And that's a picture of Christ. Hosea is the Christ figure, right. and Gomer is the unfaithful bride. Right. Now, here Hosea is saying to a nation, and God says, of course, I'll let this happen because I want to show you that I, Hosea, it's, it's a type and picture of me. The lady you've married is a type and picture of the nation. You're to redeem, you know, right, that I'll be redeeming on the cross ultimately. But here Hosea is saying that you've rebelled against me, you've broken my covenant. Mm -hmm. And in Hosea, it was a marriage covenant. With God, right. it is a the old covenant. Uh, and God is going to send a vulture, a bird mm -hmm. of prey, an eagle, so to speak, to swoop down and to uh, right. destroy them. Right. What might the eagle represent in this vision? Pretty good guess that it represents Rome. Yeah. It's God's judgment through Rome however you want to look at it, but certainly, you know, with the eagle on the banner, the SPQR thing, it's it's pretty hard to, to get away from. I, th I think it's fascinating that we have a mix of figurative language with these very literal images, right? Very literal right. things. Whether it's a 100-pound hailstone coming in the air, or it is an eagle. These things are very literal, but it's, it's right in the middle of all this imagery stuff talk here right right and, and sometimes it's kind of hard to wade through that and pick out which is the literal i think if you make all this literal then you're going to say a third of the stars white from the sky what does that mean a third of all stars in existence a third of the stars visible from earth a third, of, a third of the milky way galaxy there's no way of yeah a third of our sun going dim right well that would spell the end of everybody so. absolutely right yeah, it wouldn't just be a third of the Earth. You, know, you can't dim the sun to the one third setting, and right. then we wouldn't we'd freeze to death. <laughs> yep, it's fascinating because ancient warfare was was really all holy war in terms of gods. They had gods that fought for them: gods of the valleys, gods of the hills, gods of the kitchen, gods of warfare. And so every war was religious in nature. And so all of these things that are taking place often reference, you know, in terms of hailstones falling from the sky. It's, it's almost as if, you know, it's the gods themselves hurling these stones mm -hmm. because people understood, you know, the significance of warfare in terms of their religious beliefs. It was an important part of, of their life. Yeah. And they would often determine whose god was better by which team won. Right, 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 right. You know, like praying for a sporting event, you know, and if your team wins, it doesn't mean that your god was better than their god because they could have been praying to the same god. <laughs> right. But in the ancient world, you're exactly right. If the Philistines won, if their god bested you, like right. god, the god of Baal, they'd say, ah, oh, Baal is stronger than your god. Yeah. Well, then when the Philistines captured the ark, they took it to their god, the temple of their god. It was Dagon, I believe. Dagon, yeah, yeah. right. And uh, Dagon, over a period of time, you know, basically just fell and collapsed. And it was showing, they brought the ark in to show that their God was greater than a Hebrew God, but the ark being there with the one true God obviously showed when it destroyed Dagon that the Hebrew God was the greatest. And they send that thing back 
Because it's killing them. Yeah, we don't want. Rather than repent and turn and trust the God of the old covenant, right? And say this must be the God, right? They said, no, we'll, yeah. still, we'll hold to our God, but we'll get yeah. rid of yours. And that's what the Jews did when they rejected Jesus. They saw his miracles, and that made them mad, and they were jealous, mm -hmm. and they decided they wanted to kill their God. Yep, they became more recalcitrant. They yeah. dug their hills in. They said, well. Those miracles are by the power of Satan. Right. And they committed the unpardonable sin. Some of those folks did by saying yes, what Christ did. was doing, what the Holy Spirit was doing, was the devil. Right. Right. Well, I hope you guys enjoyed this tonight. It is a, a fine mix between very literal things that happened and this imagery. And sometimes you got to kind of put the figure out which is which. And the only way I figure, the only way that I know which is which is because I look at first century secular histories and I say, well, this is, seems to be pretty literal, and this is more imagery sort of stuff. Right. There's a lot in there that, that talks about, you know, at hand and, and shortly. That once you, you know, you need to accept that and start thinking that this was given, uh, that, that it would be fulfilled a little closer at hand than, than what a lot of people today would consider. Yeah, that's, that's one of the interpretive keys, so the context cues. Those seven phrases, near, at the door, at hand, soon, to the past, all those things, a little while longer. A little while longer. Right? Those seven phrases that's used again and again. You have that, plus you have a letter written to literal seven churches that are suffering in the right. Asia Minor. Literally seven churches in the persecution of God. But all of that, those are contextual cues in Revelation. But, but outside of that, you have Jesus' all of the discourse predicting the destruction on the apostate nation. So right. you have all these things within Revelation itself and within the rest of canon and outside of canon scripture from secular first century historians that point toward a first century fulfillment of this stuff. Amen. Amen. There's a lot of a lot of uh, similarities between, you know, Matthew was at twenty four, right? Mm -hmm. And what we read in Revelation. And of course, you know, there are other passages in Bible that, in the Bible that do speak to a far future event of Christ's coming, but it, it's pretty pretty plain and obvious that's what the author is talking about so you know, just stick close to the word and let scripture interpret scripture follow those contextual clues especially when it talks about near at hand mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and try to you know keep keep yourself grounded in the word and divorce yourself from a lot of the of the end time speculation sensationalism sensationalism yes and there are some prophecies that do have a long oh yeah range prediction. I think of Daniel, for example, predicts the same thing that Jesus predicts, the, um, the abomination that causes desolation, right, right. Uh, the, the apostate nation being judged. Daniel predicts that, but in Daniel, God says in 600 BC, seal up the scroll, the time is not near. But in Revelation, the same exact imagery is given of the same judgment of the apostate nation and this sort of thing, but it is don't seal it up, John, because right. the time is at hand. It's the same right. thing. And the difference of 600 years is the difference of it being fulfilled soon near at the door or still being a long way off. From yeah, the first uh, you know, you, I think it's Isaiah, correct me if I'm wrong, uh, that prophesied to the king. He, the, the prophet asked the king, you know, asked for a sign. The king said he wouldn't do it. And the sign was that a virgin will conceive. Okay, and that didn't happen until centuries later with Absolutely. the birth of Christ. Well, hello, Tilly. <laughs> you heard your voice up here. It's your favorite visitor. I guess we'll go ahead and close out in prayer. All right, let's pray. What is that, brother? Yep. Father, thank you so much, as always, for our time together in your word. Help us to uh, look at your word with a hunger for truth. <laughs> and, Father, uh, a willingness to be open-minded to your word. And that if we're wrong, then something that we'd, we'd change it. Father, be with uh, all the folks who will listen to this and be with them and th the decisions that they have to make and the things that they're going through, Lord, all of us. And be with our churches and help us to be true to you. And Lord, Lord always forgive us for our many sins. Thank you that we know the end of the story and that you win. Help us, Lord, to be on your side. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Tilly, you're getting into Let's trouble see. here. Knocking stuff down and plugging things. She likes her Jerry. Oh, man. Anybody? Anybody better? Yeah. <laughs> Loves that. Yeah.